Welcome back to the table, everybody. This is going to be part two of the Didn't Dare Do Anything 1812 in Russia campaign guide overview. I don't want to call it a review because I haven't played any scenarios from it, but I do want to cover some things since I first filmed the, the first video. So part one, I was just opening it and going through it and sharing some initial thoughts. And because I spaced out when I posted the videos, I had actually learned a few things about the campaign guide and kind of about um, the wargaming company in general that I thought, well, I'm going to do a part two. I had some email exchanges with David from the wargaming company. And so some of the information he shared, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to, instead of trying to edit in some clips to part one, I thought it would be more fair maybe just to make a part two and share some of the additional information I found out. And uh, I'm going to share that throughout this particular video. And I, what I want to start by first is kind of going back through the book again and share some thoughts on that. So first is... One of the things that came up, I had heard that they're doing a new layout for the campaign guides as far as the scenarios. And this is the old style is what I'm told. So the old style is when we get in here, um, this is talking about the linking some of the, the scenarios together for campaign. But when you get to the battle, what they had is, I say had, they currently have but um, this is the old style so there's like a, a page for the host has like an overall map shows all the deployment stuff then there's usually like the French briefing I suppose I guess they're the axis or whatever you want to call them with the French and then there's usually like the allies so and they'll have their own map with deployment and you could just, you know, photocopy this out, hand it to each player kind of a thing, and away you go. It's got their troops, the map, their, their setup map area and whatnot. Seems good. The new format's a little bit different. Let me grab that real quick for you. I brought some other things over, but I forgot that. Hold on. All right, I had to go find it. But this is the uh, PDF. You can get this off of the Wargaming Company website, Battle of Smolensk, 16th to 18th of August, 1812. Now... One of my life goals will be to have enough figures to play this someday because it's August 16th and that's my birthday. So I'm filming this and it's nice to know that there is at least one Napoleonic battle that happened on August 16th. So yay for me. However, this is a huge, well, I don't know if it's a huge area necessarily, but it looks like it's going to be a pretty big table. It says four to eight players and four to 16 players for the Russians, four to eight players for the French. So I don't think this is a small battle. Uh, it does say not all Russian forces are necessary, depending on the choice of the game host. I've had to look at some of the briefings. You could probably play smaller variations thereof, but it tells you um, some information here about the terrain. But I was looking to see... Um, just out of curiosity, sometimes this gives table size. So I'll just, I didn't see table size here. Usually it tells you about how big it is. So I wasn't quite sure what the table size on this one is. Um, but this is going to be the new layout. This is the new layout of the, the guide. So I know it's on the tablet, so it might seem a little small. So I apologize for that. But um, it might be hard to see. So it looks like instead of having like a separate host section, you're going to have the French briefing and their map to look at, and it just goes right into the rosters. Which is, I mean, it's fine. It's just basically almost looks the same, except you don't have a, a separate host section, right? And you got pages and pages of French, and then there. And this is interesting to me. I didn't quite. Th okay, so part of the campaign but just an eye-opener for me, is the French, when they went to battle in Russia, I did not understand or, you know, quite get the, the implications that they brought with them forces from a lot of a lot of areas that would eventually be their enemies. So I thought that was interesting. So it's just a matter of reading the timelines and seeing how things worked out. But it was a, at least a decade of warfare or, or more, 
and you know allies come and go through that so it's just interesting to see that you know when I saw so really the French took with them uh, Polish and all these different groups of people who sent troops with the French to, to fight Russia so I thought that was just you know kind of an interesting thing uh, but anyhow then you get the the Russian set up here and it looks like that's kind of kind of how it goes wow that is a lot of Russians that's that's a lot of a lot of that's a lot of figures to have to put on your board so I could see somehow why is that like an oddly colored I must have clicked this to highlight something on there the PDF looks a little weird yeah I must have clicked on something but that's what I was trying to find was a table size that is something that I'm not seeing and that could just be me not navigating very well I, I will say that was something that I liked here I, I believe there's an example here on the host and yeah the battlefield this is from the book battlefield of Coburn requires a table representing two scale miles by three scale miles and I had to admit I don't see anything like that here because I really wanted to see how big the table would be so the mileage might be here on the map I'm just not seeing you know unless that's each square is supposed to be like a scale mile uh, which there could be explanations like if this was part of a book that had all of these new scenario types probably tells you how to how to read the map the way it's broken down so you could get your scales and sizes so uh, but yeah, so just a, a matter of new format, old format. I, I'm not opinionated either way, having not actually played the game. So it was just, you know, something for me to learn. Like, oh, okay, so there is an old format. This is the old format in the uh, Didn't Dare Do Anything book. And then new format is coming. And I think I think David mentioned in an email, like, there's an Iberia book. Uh, so I could quite be wrong on that. I'm not good at remembering things that I read. Okay, so anyway, that was something um, as far as the layout of the books. Okay, so with that, the big thing that I wanted to talk about was the painting guide. So let me get past here. When I first looked at the painting guide, I didn't understand what I was looking at necessarily. Like, I get the fact that this is telling me for Laguerre, you know, or if I got my, my Ligny for the line, you know, pick what you want and you paint it out. You know, like I, I know what a drummer is, okay, or the coronet player kind of a thing. Like I get that. Or if I have engineers, the sapper. Like I get the painting guide, okay. But some things that I, I learned that I thought was very fascinating was, long story, uh, flipping through YouTube trying to find ESR content, and I'm actually surprised there's not a whole lot. Um, it's quite easier to find like Black Powder and some other games, maybe, I guess, you know, popularity wise, but ESR I think is, is quite phenomenal. So there wasn't much to find. And one of the things that I found, which I'm really surprised doesn't have more views and I'll probably forget to link it in the, in the video, but if you hear this and just want to search it out, um, I forget the name exactly of the person who put it out, but he does his podcast is called like Wargaming Recon, and they do an interview with David. Um, so it's these two guys from the Wargaming Recon. I think they're part of like a larger podcasting group, which is probably more popular, and so they might have this interview posted elsewhere. But if you're on YouTube and you can find this interview with David, it is an amazing insight to some of the the company you know behind the scenes kind of things and I would just wholeheartedly recommend you go find that and if you know who who the Wargaming Recon people are you know give them a, a watch uh, the, the guy who kind of runs that looks like he posts almost daily on stuff the you know quarantine got nothing better to do you know we go check out their channel um, you know it's nice friendly but I was just surprised that it didn't seem to have that many views for this interview with David. And I was like, wow, do people just not like David? Uh, David has a lot of great information. See, then this is something else, too. Not knowing anything about David, I 
I sometimes I see games that it feels like people are just putting stuff out, but actually David seems super, super knowledgeable on Napoleonics, and so to hear his insights and design ideas onto why th certain things were done a certain way in ESR was really cool to watch. So yeah, go find that interview. So from the interview, what I learned and I thought was really fascinating was David's wife does these color guides. So she does does these. I guess she draws the people. They must have a template that she follows and then she puts all this together. And the painting guides are, I mean, these are great. Now, here's what I took for granted. So I'm going to share a lesson learned and I'm going to share what I took for granted. So what I took for granted was, you know, I'm going to fold this over like this a little bit. I was hoping I could zoom this in and focus a little bit more. Okay, so here's what I've learned now after kind of spending a little bit of time in Napoleonics. Yes, over that couple decades of Napoleonics, not just, you know, through 1812 or, you know, 10 years, but just kind of through those early 1800s, maybe late 1790s, armies were changing all the time, how they deployed their makeup, um, you know, how, how the technology followed, different types of rifles, and so their uniforms would change. And, you know, maybe over a couple of years they wore this, a few years later they wore this. Things were in a constant state of flux and change. And generally what really stuck, it seems like, is their primary color, almost like a football team, right? French blue, British red. But even in then, I've, I've seen among that, though, there will sometimes be like uh, they were British, but they had some dudes that just wore like all black uniforms. I'm like, oh, those Austrians are like, oh, no, that's British or artillery or, you know different things so there's very hard to just say this was consistently what anybody wore you know for any any long period of time however prior to say like these painting guides i'm just sharing kind of my history and understanding through some reading not uncommon for folks to buy lots of books of napoleonic era and it was kind of, I'm going to paraphrase David in his story on this a little bit, was, you know, they had, he said that there would be people who would say, well, I don't need to buy the campaign guide, you know, like they're great for the scenarios, but I don't need to buy it for the painting guides because I've got, you know, all these books I've purchased over the years that tell me, you know, they have all these color plates and things like that. But then when it comes time to paint your figures, they had to then go through those books and find that specific color plate. So if you have a book that's like several hundred pages of mostly text and just a you know a few color plates here and there you'd have to dig out your book of several hundred pages to get the color plate for this one person and then go find this other book sort through that couple hundred pages you know so they weren't really collected in any one place everybody has their color plate spread out among many books that makes sense to me if you're like an osprey collector osprey books i think are amazing but if you want to get a couple good color plates out of out of them, you know, they sell a book for everything. You know, there's one book for maybe Waffen SS Summer Field Uniform, you know, um, Desert Africa. Okay, that's one book. Then I have to buy another book for maybe Waffen SS Western Europe 1944 July 5th. Like they might have an actual book for just that day. So they're not all collected. So I have to have this huge collection of books. And so what David and his wife have done, I think, and any you know, and I don't know who all has helped them on the side with this, but it sounds like it's mostly just them, that they have taken all those color plates or however they did it and have put all of that into a collection for you here. And so when I first did the unboxing, it's like, okay, cool, yeah, there's color plates, but how do I color my people? And like I totally skipped over the importance of this these um, painting guides like my my brain didn't comprehend how important of a treasury this is for another reason too the uniforms in those other books are also and i've looked through some paintings online and stuff the uniforms can be extremely detailed and so if you're trying to paint your little figures that are, you know, maybe 10 millimeter, even six millimeter, 
you're not going to get that kind of detail on those figures or it's going to be very very difficult to do so so what these color guides have done in my opinion is they've taken those very complicated uniform patterns and put them into a practical guide so you can paint your small figures that are lacking all that attention to detail that you might get in the much larger figures so my appreciation for the painting guide has completely changed after after you know reading some comments from folks and, and watching that interview with David and so what I see now is you know an amazing collection of of work which they uh, which David did take a moment to talk about like the price of the guides and stuff like that the physical cost of printing the books are not that expensive but the cost of the books helps cover the time and effort they've spent in researching and possibly purchasing their own books and coming and developing the the product so it, it makes it just all made a lot more sense okay so that's just some general thoughts on the painting guide that I did not understand or appreciate at first glance what a treasure trove this is so let's see I'm still rocking some diet a and w today ah, it's my birthday so why, you know, I'm spoiling myself a little bit. All right, so one of the comments that I had originally with the painting guide is, okay, so let's say we're looking at the line. That comes to my mind. So you get your, uh, I got my box back behind me. But anyway, you get your box of figures. And yeah, you know what? Let me go grab that box of figures. And through the magic of television, we're back. Okay, so, oh, I bumped the camera. We're gonna, oh, I'm trying to stop it from wiggling, but. Okay, so let's let's play a game. I get, get this in the mail or store. It's got the little hooks, so I wonder if they sell these in retail. But let's say you get home, you got your figures, you open the box, and you pull out your bases, and then you grab your little piece of paper tells me infantry Russian mid-war late okay so I guess infantry is Russian infantry is a little different uh, let's find them they're mostly just green I think if I just dip them in military just green will be okay all right so I get to the Russian section and I'm looking and it just says Infantry. So here, I might say, you know, we got 1st and 3rd Battalions, 1st and 3rd Battalions, got names of specific places. So my problem, or the question I had was, okay, which of these do I pick? And I would say, just based off some feedback I've got, I'm going to share some feedback I got, but um, unless your scenario really says specifically, like, who's involved I I'm thinking it might not actually matter you know pick something that looks good to you kind of a thing now I'm gonna I was trying to find some of the French because that one that's the one that had me asking the most questions because not the horses, not the horses, Jaegers. Okay, we'll look at some, well, that's Russian Jaegers. Okay, well, here's something. Okay, so I've got specifically some Russian Jaegers, mid-war, late war. All right, but anyway, I've got senior Jaeger regiments, junior Jaeger regiments, first and third battalion. Okay, that's something different, but I got Jaegers. Fortunately, I don't see a whole lot of difference between the, the Jaegers, um, I don't see a whole lot of difference. That's my untrained eye looking. Looks pretty much about the same. I'm sure there's a difference that I'm overlooking. But what I would do is I was like, well, since I want to know exactly, I'll just look at my scenario and it's going to tell me what I need. So it'll say here, 28th Jaegers. Okay, cool. I can work with that, 28th Jaegers. So I can look back here and go 28th Jaegers. So that's how I'm going to paint these guys. The only problem is at some point you might end up with 
10th Jaegers and 14th Jaegers. And maybe they are painted differently. So what you'll have to do at some point, depending on how deep you get into it is, and this is the part that a lot of people know and understand and they spend a lifetime painting, is you're gonna have to buy more miniatures. Some that are gonna be specifically for the 28th Jaeger, some specifically for the 10th Jaeger, some specifically for the 14th. If you wanted to only ever in your life play the, the Battle of um, Goro Dechno, if you never played any other battle, your, your figures would be painted perfectly for this. Then when you look at the French, and this is where I started to get a little bit lost and confused. Uh, because sometimes we say French, but I think HU is like Hungarian, Austrian, uh, it's not always French, Saxon, Saxony, I think. And so, yeah, sometimes it's your French allies, not necessarily the, only the French. But I was looking here for the French because what got me, yeah, here's French, 20, 19th Ligny, 26th Ligny or Line, um, 11th Ligair. So if I come back here and I want to find Ligny for the French, there's some Ligair. But I'm thinking, I guess, there's not a whole lot of difference. Um, but when I was looking here at the Ligny, then it was like, okay, Here's my, my Ligny, but there's Officer, Sapper, Grenadier, Fusilier, or Fusilier, Voltgear, Drummer. Okay, so here's, here's where I was getting lost. If I'm looking at my, I thought I just had them, French. You know, I thought I had this more together than what it is. I was trying to make a really dramatic point and now I can't find the stuff that I want. Well, here's the Ligair, right? Boom. Which one of these in the box is a sapper? Which one of these are car carabineers? Which ones are the chasseurs or chasers? I think someone called them. And that's the part I got lost. It's like, okay, so which of these need to be painted what? because the figures don't really jump out to me. It just says Liguer. So that's where I was struggling a little bit. Now, luckily, David came to the rescue and he sent an email that had some insight saying, okay, well, in your, on your square, when you base these things and like in these red brigades and whatnot, you might have a battalion of carabineers or a section, or you might have a couple um, chasseurs or volt gear. So what you could do is on your base when you paint figures is you might have like two painted as carabineers, two painted as a chasseur, two painted. And that represents the, the loadout in the different battalion. So when you have your, you know, Legares, you don't have to worry necessarily specifically which one is which. The, you're going to paint them, paint like maybe a couple of each type to kind of represent the um, all the gathered battalions that would include these different units. And that made sense to me. So it's not like I have to worry about which one of these specifically. Now, you might, when looking at them, see one that has a tall Shaco or something. Like there's a guy here, he's got the tall little helmet piece. Maybe I could paint him as the sapper because the rest of these just, just have helmets. So you kind of have to maybe eyeball it a little bit to match it up, but you might be able to figure out a little bit what you're looking at. Okay, so that, that's what I was struggling at first, but that little bit of insight from David helped out. Now, what I also want to share is one of the YouTube comments that I got. First of all, I just want to say thank you everyone for the comments, whether it's sharing your experiences with Napoleonic gaming, which I think is fascinating, and like I said in one of my first videos, one of my hesitations to getting into Napoleonics was kind of that fear factor. I thought that it was very much an avant-garde kind of a thing where um, people were very kind of um, maybe self, I don't know what you want to call it, but maybe it wasn't as inviting a community as, as, uh, as other gaming communities. But it turns out, I, I, I thought that you know that was wrong. That, that was a fear that I had, a myth, but it, I didn't think that was true because as I got into it, I saw people were very loving and very you know caring for their, their genre of gaming, if you want to call it that. 
and very open and very much wanting to share. And the comments that you all have been leaving on the videos really shows that the Napoleonics gaming community is actually very open and welcoming and loving to share with new people. Uh, you know, someone was someone put, um, you know, they're just happy to see somebody, you know, other people that from, you know, besides just World War II. Like that's, I think, one of the larger historicals is World War II. And Napoleonic seems to be kind of on that smaller cusp of gaming, but very open to share that with people, to bring more people in. And so just by the comments I'm reading, people have been very, very open and sharing and wanting to, you know, kind of help spread that word. So I appreciate all the, the wonderful comments. And I wanted to share this one. This was a highlighted comment from Elliot James. And this was great. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but I printed this specifically. I'm going to keep it with my box because he, he took the time to write out some really good information to help me sort it out. And it says, let's help with the French. So it starts out with Liguerre, which are the light. So officers, standard bearers get painted the same, drummers, you know, so I can look at some of this stuff. And with this as a little bit of a guide, there's the ligne or line, officers, standard bearers, drummers, cornet sappers, terms are the same as the Liguerre. Fusiliers are the bulk of the unit. Four companies like the Chasseur, Grenadiers had one company. Voltiers are exactly the same as the Liguerre, one company. So as I'm laying out my pieces, and with this nice laid out chart, I can kind of figure out how I want to paint them and then arrange them on the base so I can be representative of the different companies that would make up that uh, brigades. Because I think play, we're playing on a brigade level. Like the brigade is made up of battalions, and I think we're putting a brigade on each of the bases, I think. But um, yeah, I could be wrong. I'm still learning all that terminology. But anyway, this is very cool. And then he's got a section. So you see our ESR uses 10 millimeter figures in the box. These are small and you're looking for mass effect. So just a nice bit of advice. So you paint your command figures and then um, paint the fusiliers, paint the command shusters. He was just giving some paint tips, which I thought was really cool. And then also he's got some links to go look at some resources on the internet. So this was like a really helpful guide. So thank you, um, Elliot James. I just wanted to kind of share and appreciation that you sent that. So I actually, with tips that I'm getting from the community on like the batch painting, so when I start painting these guys and have them lined up, then I can like go and paint all their coats, you know, and then like make sure the pants are still white, make sure, or whatever color the pants need to be, you know, but I can go back and just do one item on each figure. And I figure what I would do to start out is like, I'm just gonna paint one baggie because the baggie is all separated. So this is my French Liguerre, or the lights, my light units. So there's a few here, but I'll be able to line them up and say, just make sure all the coats get blue and the pants are blue and do that for all the people. And then, you know, the next thing might be the helmets. Looks like all their helmets are, or their ha I call them helmets, but the hats, look like all the hats are black. So with all the tips from the community, and a deeper understanding and appreciation of the painting guide, and like I said, all these wonderful tips, I feel much more confident and ready to paint these things. And then that's where the next thing came up that um, had some comments. Some folks said, well, because I mentioned I was going to use GW contrast paints. I wanted to use, well, I think I still will, the contrast paints because I like how they shade the figures. And you might not need that. Um, they're gonna be so small, that shading might not be necessary. So I'm gonna take a look at some of my other paints and I might just use the more conventional paints. I've got a, uh, I don't know, let me grab it here. I use this for painting some Warhammer stuff. And then I bought some other paints specifically for Warhammer, but a couple years ago, my brother-in-law got me this. This is a, it's a lot of paint. Um, and I think I could probably find a green to use for the Russians. You know, they got an army green. That might be what I use. I don't know. I was trying to, I got different shades of blue that I could use for the French. I don't think I want to give them ultramarine blue, uh, but it'd just be a little bit of experimenting. The only reason I'm not as happy with these 
is you had to squeeze the paint out of a bottle onto a palette, which, you know, in itself probably isn't a terrible thing in practice. I, I learned how to create a wet palette so the paints don't dry out immediately. But the thing I like about the GW paints and the, the contrast paints is they come, I don't have one here at the table, but they come in a bottle that you flip open, that you flip open. And so the bottle itself becomes like a, a pot of paint. So you just, you know, dip your brush in there. And that's probably still not the ideal way to do it. But for me, it's simple and convenient. So I think I'll still go with contrast paints and I just have to make a trip out to the store and see if I can find some colors that would work good for the, the blue. You know, this is a pretty, pretty dark blue. And I'll have to see if we've got some contrast paints that are similar. I'm just gonna take this book with me and then look at the paints they have. Um, you know, there's Swiss, so I'm like, oh, that's a red, but that might not be the same red that the British use, but they're gonna look like British when I'm done with them. So I'm just gonna have to experiment and find some colors that I like. See, look, here's a lot of green. And I'd be like, oh, you, you've got a bunch of Russians in your French allies. No, no, I don't. They're just, that's the color that the troopers of the Chasseur à Chavel wore. Uh, so, yeah, this is amazing. There's like 400 figures, I think, I read here at the beginning of this. There's 400 little dudes in here that are all painted up to help guide you. Uh, some praising infantry. I just look in pink. Like, uh, I think every color is represented in here. But that's just some additional thoughts and comments that I wanted to share on the guide for a part two. And yeah, I think, think we'll just kind of wrap it up there.